Thank you. I am on, but the mic is not. Let's clarify. When we talk about Jesus, I'm Hello? Aha. Uh -huh. That's an aha moment. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Do you need comfort today? God is the God of all comfort. I think the whole world needs comfort today. Now, God is the God of all comfort. And I want to say a prayer right now. Father, the whole world needs comfort right now. America certainly does. Look at Afghanistan. Almighty God, Afghanistan needs your comfort. They need your intervention. They need your help. God, go save the people of Afghanistan. Lord, send such a blanket of comfort upon this earth to people who are so on the edge, afraid, trembling with fear about the future. And Father, the elderly who are stuck in their homes, afraid, worried and wondering, what will become of America? What will become of the world? What will become of them? Now, I want you to all interact. In fact, could you stand? God, you're the God of all comfort. Comfort your people. Lord, throughout the world, throughout the world, all the hot spots, all the places that are war-torn. The Christians in China, Lord. God, North Korea. Those Christians, Lord, they're being starved out. They're being worked to death. Lord, comfort your people. Comfort America, Lord, under this difficult regime. Lord God, comfort us. Change things. You're the game changer. Jesus, you're the game changer. Change the game. Change the game in America. Bring in your great glory and your great power, your spirit of might and power to this earth. God, that wonderful, wonderful power for Holy Ghost. Send it now upon the world, Lord. We need the third and final great awakening. We need it now, O oh God. You see people that are so troubled, so beleaguered, so worried. God, comfort them, God of all comfort. Comfort these people. Comfort all of us, oh God, with your precious Holy Spirit. Wrap us in a cocoon of your wonder, the wonder of your personality. Jesus, there's nobody like you. The Son of God, begotten by the Father, not made. Do you, body of Christ, have a revelation of what that means? That Jesus was begotten by the Father. He was not made. In other words, God didn't make a ready-made Savior that came onto the scenes of life as a young man, just poof, to start his, his last part of his life as the Savior. God didn't make him. God begot him. In other words, the divine seed the divine sperm of God. It had to be the sperm of God the Father himself inculcated into the womb of a virgin in order for the Lord Jesus Christ to come forth legally into the earth. There's legalities with God. Things have to be done legally. Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, had to be born of a virgin. 
And he had to because it was prophesied throughout the Old Testament that, that Jesus would be born of a virgin. Well, God couldn't then just send a fully developed man who became the Messiah. No, no, he had to come legally into the earth through birth. And the only way that you're going to be born in this earth is through a woman's womb. I don't care what some men are saying. It's not going to happen. But legally, you have to come, and Jesus had to come legally through the womb of a woman, and the woman to contain the divine sperma of God, the woman had to be a virgin. And I've read some of the studies about Mary. Mary was probably only 14 or 15 when she became pregnant with that divine sperm. But what the ethnography about her is, what's known about her is that she spent so much time in the temple praying. That was her heart. She was so on fire for God. And you know, the Jews knew that there was a Messiah that was coming. They knew it for, uh, since God began to prophesy in the Old Testament. So Jesus was long awaited. And to have somebody in with as circumspect as she was, to be found in the temple praying for that Messiah. And because of her, her righteous stature before God, God used that, that young woman to contain the divine sperma of God. Isn't that marvelous? To be the, the woman handpicked from that generation to develop the seed and carry the seed who would become our Messiah. He had to be born legally, or he could not legally then carry our sins. And he had to be human. He was very God of very God, but he came in a human body. It had to be that way. And then, after he was crucified, that holy blood was shed for us, and went into the ground so that the earth could be and so that mankind could be cleansed and forgiven of sin. And then we all know that Jesus Christ died and went to hell. Does everybody understand that? If he had not gone to hell because Satan, with the disobedience, with the sin, Adam knew full well when he ate that fruit, that he was sinning. But think about the, the terrible, terrible dilemma that Adam was in. It said that Eve was the most beautiful woman that had ever been created or ever will be created. She was utter perfection. Of course she was. She came from God's hand. He made her. And think about it. She ate because she was beguiled by the serpent. Now, think about the term, the horns of the dilemma. What does Adam do? Does he lose this beautiful, beautiful mate who is so simpatico with him that they're truly one? Does he lose her? Or does he eat the apple with her? Men, what would you do? What? <laughs> oh my, I've thought about it. Haven't you thought about this? What would you do? You know what he should have done? He should have gone to God and appealed to God. He should have said, God, you walk with us in the garden in the cool of the day. Come down and talk to me now and tell me now. What do I do now? And do you realize the import of that, that you could be going through the most horrific thing that you couldn't talk to anybody else about and you couldn't figure out in your own life, whatever would you do? You're 
presented, let's say, hypothetically, with such a situation that you can't turn to anybody. There's nobody to turn to who would understand your dilemma or your choice that you had to make because it's so difficult. To use a worldly expression, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Do you understand what I'm saying? Both choices are terrible. Now, people face this all the time in their lives. They have two bad choices. What do you do with two bad choices? What would you ever do? I want to tell you a story. Tony Cook told this story. You can sit if you want. But we're going to pray. Go back to the Alamo. You know that there was a standoff. That uh, boy was there, and what was the other? Davy Crockett was there, and I think there was a third notable from our history. Who? Jim Boy, Davy Crockett, who was the third? There was a third. I don't remember now. But this is hypothetical. This didn't really happen. You know that they got slot, they were killed. But there were people who survived because of their heroism. There were women and children, and I believe men that survived. But I want you to hypothetically think of the Alamo. So they have to send, this isn't history, this is a hypothetical. Two bad choices, two difficult choices. Adam was faced with dire, dire choice. What does he do? He sinned against God now. Or he hasn't yet, but what's he going to do? Sin against God? What's he going to do? So think of the Alamo. They send out a writer to go get troops because in the Alamo, there were troops that were coming. They didn't get there in time. So they send out a writer by that, I mean it, not a legal, I'm not talking about insurance rider here. <laughs> I'm talking about a horseback rider. They're up in the, in the crow's nest of the fort, and they send him out. He's their only hope. He's the only one that they can send. And he rides out into the woods. However, because they're in the fort and they are in the crow's nest, they can see that there's a whole tribe waiting to massacre this man. He's riding right into them, and he doesn't know it. And they're a tribe that's known for extreme wickedness. You, you know what I'm talking about? If they capture people. So horns of a dilemma, what are they going to do? If they let him go, he'll be tortured in the most horrible graphic ways. And it's certain that he's going to ride out into that can't stop him, can't yell at him, he won't, he can't hear. What would we do? What would we do? Tell me, what would you do? It's a, it's a dilemma that Adam was faced with. So they shot him. They got a sharpshooter and they shot him. That was love. That was love. Now, I'm not saying this ever happened. Perhaps it did. It's, there's a likelihood it did. My point is that Adam now is on the horns of a dilemma, like many people are in life. Many people are. What's he going to do? And there are some people who are being tortured for Christ in the world. That's a reality. What are they going to do? This pastor from uh, Canada, what's he going to do? He goes to jail on urine-stained floors, filthy floors, floors that have never really been cleaned at all, no blanket. And you know why he goes there? He goes there. His brother is sent with him, is put in jail with him. You know why he, he has to suffer that? And it's freezing cold, no blanket, nothing. You know why? Because he has church, and he won't shut his doors. That's why he has to endure that. He won't shut the doors of his church. 
And on Easter Sunday, when the police came in mass, he yelled at them, get out, you Nazis, get out. Don't come back unless you have a warrant. Now, I'm telling you, we all have to make decisions. How great a sacrifice are we going to make to serve Jesus Christ? How great. If they come to your front door in the times of head and say, you either take this mark, it's called the mark of the beast, or we're going to throw you in prison. What are you going to do? Does anybody know what they're going to do? If you take the mark, you're dead for eternity. You've consigned your, your spirit, your soul away to hell forever and ever in the lake of fire. If you don't take the mark, you go to prison. Now, I tell you, I had no earthly idea of going this way at all. But we're headed into troublesome times, and we have to have such a firm relationship with Jesus Christ that we know ahead of time, and we pray ahead of time, that God give us a backbone of steel. Do you understand? Pastors are being harassed throughout the world now. Because, and in, even in America, we had, we had, who, you can have a covering that's godly and the people are protected. You get an ungodly covering and it opens the door for the devil. And if you can strike the shepherd, the sheep will scatter. So I'm telling you, you better be praying for your pastors. Every day. I'm telling you that. I'm giving you word of, of wisdom. You better be praying for your pastors. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is serious business. This is life and death. Do you understand? This is life and death, beloveds. And the pastors in, that are throughout, even in the United States now, because we've got a wicked head covering in, in our government. In many and, and in even state governments. So it's open the door for the devil. And of course, who are they going to go after? They're going to go after the shepherds. So pray. Word to the wise pray. So, what's Adam going to do? You know what he should have done? Called a meeting with God. He should have stopped in his tracks. Okay, Eve, you ate the apple. I can't bear life without you. You're perfect. God made you just for me. You fit my personality, my heart, my soul, everything. I can't give you up. But I can't eat the apple because I'm under authority to majesty on high. God told me specifically not to eat of this apple. Well, when you're in the horns of a demo, d dilemma like that, you go to the highest source. When you can't figure out what to do in life, one's a compromise, and the others, well, both are compromised. One's a compromise to God, and the other's a compromise to the powers that are. You better know what you're going to do. You better have such a backbone of steel with a relationship with Jesus Christ and God the Father that nothing daunts you. Because there's wickedness in our world now, in America, and if there weren't enough, now with the hordes that have come in in the southern border, we're going to see a whole change in our culture. But God has a rescue plan. He's got two rescue plans. In fact, one is a great awakening. The greatest, mightiest move of God the world has ever seen. The third, last, and final move of God. To bring in people that can't be brought in any other way. And bring in the multitudes. That's his first rescue plan. 
You know what his second rescue plan is? The rapture of the church. Amen. Everybody better be ready. You better be ready for the rapture. We have one split second, less than a millisecond, when we will ascend with Jesus Christ, but we have to hear a shout. He will shout, and we will go up. And what is so troublesome is that there will be people who know Jesus Christ, even filled with the Spirit, but they're so far away from him in their heart, their mind, their soul, their spirit, that they won't even hear the shout. You've all seen the movie Left Behind. Has everybody seen that movie? Oh my goodness, we need to show that movie. We need to have Friday night showing that movie Left Behind. Have you seen it? Okay, because there will be Christians left behind, and it simply cannot be. If we think it's bad now, we have no idea the horrors to come. Read the book of Revelation. So, if Adam had gone to God, after all, God's God. Is there any problem that God can't solve on earth? I mean, we could think from now until forever. We couldn't think of one problem that God, our Father, couldn't solve. Is that right, body? Everything, he can, everything's solvable with him. Everything's totally able to be worked out because we have an omni omnipotent, omniscient, holy God who reigns over us. There's nothing he can't solve. So, given that information, and Adam knew him well, did he not? Do you remember in Genesis it says that Adam walked with God, or God walked with Adam in the cool of the day? And it, do you remember after Adam sinned, it said God went walking in the garden? It's interesting because God didn't run into the garden in rage enraged at Adam what he had done. Because think about what, what Adam did. He consigned the whole human race to death, destruction, chaos, sin. And furthermore, he consigned humanity that who knows the number, maybe half of humanity would be forever in hell in a lake of fire tormented forever and ever. That's what Adam did. Why wouldn't God go tearing into the garden in anger and rage? But it doesn't say that. He walked into the garden and he called out to Adam. And the Bible doesn't say there was anger or rage in his voice. It just said he walked into the, anger, into the garden and said, Adam, where are you? Now, we're God's creation. He created every one of us, but he created this earth with such marvelous beauty. Watch some of these uh, shows, travelogues, and see the amazing things that God has created on earth. God created all of that, and he created it for us, for our pleasure and our beauty. So that's the other thing Adam did when he disobeyed God. The earth, the Bible says, the earth fell. It went into disarray because of sin. Sin always brings sorrow. It always brings chaos, disarray. It always brings trouble. And so through Adam's sin, instead of going to God and negotiating or telling him the truth, all he had to say was, she ate the apple. What do I do now? I can't live without her. What am I going to do? I, can't, I won't sin against you. And we have to have that template, template on the inside, backbone of steel. I won't sin, sin against you, God. Has to be there, especially in the days ahead when there will be huge opposition to capitulate, to compromise, 
to go the way of not the few, but the many. And so Adam caused also the fall of the earth. God's magnificent creation. It's not in the beauty that it was. It's beautiful, but it doesn't have the beauty that it did. But the Bible says that God walked into the garden and he called for Adam. So had Adam gone to God with this horrible dilemma that he could not solve, if he had gone to God, God would have simply walked in the garden and talked to him about it and told him how he could solve it, how he, God, could solve it. Instead, Adam compromised. So I guess one of the things I'm talking about is compromise. What will we do to compromise? How will we as Christians compromise? There's going to be some rough choices ahead, beloveds. What are we going to do? We always have to go with the road less traveled, which is toward Jesus, our Savior. And I want to admonish us all. Get a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship with Jesus Christ is the most important thing of every relation, of any relationship on earth. And I'm saying this to you, a word to the wise. Dig very deep. Get very deep with relationship with Jesus Christ. Do whatever you have to do to set aside other things to go after Jesus. Lay them aside. Spend great amounts of time, whatever that a great amount of time is to you in your life, begging God to reveal his son to you. Ephesians chapter 1, Ephesians chapter 3. Open the eyes of my understanding and flood the eyes of my heart with light with regard to Jesus Christ. I want to know my Savior better. Go after Jesus like you never have before. Nothing now for the times ahead of us. Nothing is more important than a relationship with Jesus Christ. Nothing. Do you hear me? There's nothing more important. Because he'll provide the food. God told me April 26, 2010, woke me up at 5 o'clock in the morning because I'd been praying the night before. Dig out my ears to hear your voice in the morning. I wish I would have said the afternoon. Five was early for me. But I said, dig out my ears to hear your voice. Do you ever pray that? Pray it, pray it, pray it, pray it. Pray it and pray it and pray it. And so I prayed that, 5 o'clock in the morning, July 26, 2010, God spoke these ominous words to me. Everything was fine then. Everything was wonderful. He said, famine is coming. Now, these are serious things I'm talking to you about. But if you don't hear it from the pulpit, where are you going to hear it from? I have an obligation to talk truth. When it comes to eating or not eating, what are you going to do? If you don't have a developed relationship with Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit, the Holy Spirit, what are you going to do when you're hungry? What will you do? What will I do? Well, I'll tell you what, God has a plan. Remember he said he would set a meal before us in the presence of our enemies? He meant it. We've had visions and dreams of no food. In fact, my sister was telling me the other day a vision she had, no food. 
saying, Jesus, I'm hungry. He said, open your hand. And he filled it with food. And we ate. Now, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, don't be far off from him. Capture his heart. Oh, what a big heart he has. And the thing is, God is so great and he's so wondrous that there's nothing he can't pull off. He can make food out of air. Do you know that the Israelis now have found a way to make water out of the air? To get water out of air? Isn't that amazing? But leave it to God's people to be able to find that way. But all of this comes with having a very close relationship with Jesus Christ. And I want to leave you with this also. Jesus is the nearest and dearest friend you will ever have. Closer than a brother. Closer than twin sisters. Everything in this world revolves around him. Whether it looks like it does or doesn't look like it does. Everything revolves around Jesus. Now, given that that's true, why in the world wouldn't we go after him and court his favor above all else? In the world, you court the favor of those who have the most money and prestige and are the it people. Well, I'll tell you who the it person is. Capital I. It's Jesus. Spend much time talking to him. And then spend time just loving on him. Just loving him. Pour out your heart to him. And tell him how much you love him and how much you adore him. And how much you appreciate all he does for you. Just pour and pour your love on him and watch and see what happens. It's a secret. It's a secret in life. It's a divine exchange. We pour and pour and pour our love on him. And we load him with accolades and worship and praise and thanksgiving and tell him, telling him how much we love him. And then he pours back on us. I t I've told you this before. I can't say it enough times because it was so utterly astonishing to me. When I came back to the Lord, I was born again as a child. But I got into the leftist movement. And that's why I understand these people. Got into the leftist movement and hated God a hundred percent. hundred percent I hated God. I wanted to choke his people. I literally wanted to get my hands on them. But I told you this the night that God came to me. And he said, take all the base qualities of man and walk toward the light. I said, what's the light? Didn't have a clue. Didn't remember my dad reading from our big red Bible about the light. And he said, the light is my son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But one of the next things he did was he opened his heart of love and he poured it into my heart. And I could stand here right now and weep. If only you could feel the intensity of the love of God. If only, if only everybody on earth could feel the intensity of that love. The intensity of his love translated like this. His saying through that love, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will love you forever. I approve of you. You are my child. I will do everything for you. 
that you ask me to do. I will die on a cross just for you because I love you so dearly that I will do that willingly just for you. And I can't even tell you the intense intensity of that love. It was so intense that my literal heart organ began to ache with pain. It was so wonderful. That's the love that God has for people, even sinners. That's the love he has for everyone on earth. Can you imagine the heartbreak he feels when people deny him and choose to go to hell? And I'll tell you one thing, knowing about that love, Jesus will grieve for all eternity that he's lost those people. He knows everyone that are in hell now. Some of them have done despicable things to Christians. He will love those people throughout all eternity. That's how intense his love is. And that's how intense his love is for you and for me. I'll never, ever forget that love. So, if I could sum it up, draw nigh to God. Draw very close to him. There's a reason that this group of people on earth are on earth now. Because God knows the very times and the seasons the hours, the minutes that each one of us were to be born. And he's a very purposeful God. So we are end time warriors. We're here for a reason. We're here because he knows what he's put into us. We have life lessons that he's brought us through to make us who we are today so that we have a backbone of steel. And we're going to need it. So draw near to Jesus Christ. Get very close to him. And you do that by talking to him. Talk to him all the time. Tell him how much you love and appreciate him. Pour out your heart to him. Read his word. Study, especially in the New Testament, who he is. The magnificence of who this wonderful Savior is. And then get to know God the Father. God the Father does not sit on a throne unapproachable. He is in unapproachable light. But guess what? You can go up to that throne. You can throw your arms around him. You can kiss him on both cheeks. And you can nestle your head in his neck anytime you want. Because God is love. That's what the Bible says. And that's what he showed me that day. The love of God. You'll never know it till you get to heaven. You'll never understand how great is the love of the Father for his children. Practice going to the throne. And nestling your nose in his neck. And telling him how much you love him. Will you do that? Get to know God the Father and Jesus. And talk to him all the time. Splay out your heart to them. Tell them everything. Father, we thank you so much that we serve such a wonderful Savior. It beggars our imagination who you are. And what you have done for us through Jesus Christ and what you will do for us going into these times now. We just say to you, we want more of you. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, give us more. And I as a pastor want to say this publicly. Jesus, I appreciate so much that I have the privilege of serving you. God, my Father, I appreciate 
so much the privilege of serving you. And Holy Ghost, I appreciate so much the privilege of getting to know you and serving you. I count it such an honor to be able to stand in a pulpit and talk about you. It's the highest honor of anything I've ever experienced in my life. And I want you to know publicly how much I appreciate you that you gave me this honor. I ask that you'd bless us all now and bring every one of us and everyone in the sound of my voice into a greater relationship with Jesus. And I want to say this. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, if you think that you're too evil, too bad, too wicked, or whatever you think about yourself, having a relationship with Jesus Christ is simply to turn to him and ask him to come into your heart and to forgive your sins. It's that easy. He's not a hard taskmaster. He is the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and the Prince of Peace. But he's also a friend. Capital F. He's, a, he's our friend. And if you will simply say, Lord, I've done such terrible things. I don't know how I'd ever come to you. I've hurt so many people. And I'm saying this specifically to people. I don't know how I could ever come to you. What he's saying is, come unto me, and I will give you rest. If you'll call upon my name, I will in no wise cast you out. And for those listening, it's as easy as saying the name of Jesus with intent and purpose from your heart. Thank you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Would you all stand, please? Now, Lord, we gather here just for you, just for you. We welcome you, Lord. We thank you. We ask that you bless your people, that you speak to each one of them individually and talk to them about the plans of the Lord and the things that you have for them. Bless them richly. Every impossibility that they face, show them that it's entirely possible. Did you hear me? Every impossibility you face is entirely possible. You just get more of Jesus, more of his word, and you can turn anything because of the power of Jesus. Lord, we bless your people. I'm asking that even now you give them knowledge of witty ideas and inventions, how to turn their situation around. Speak to their hearts right now. Nothing is impossible with God. Everything is possible with God. 
and we thank you for doing it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I'd like to take the morning tithes and offerings. I want to go to a familiar passage. God told me when I was a young Christian, he said, learn how to milk the honey out of the rock. He said, learn how to get the gold out of my word. He said, learn how to put pressure on every single scripture that you can make it yours. This is what God has for us. This is what God wants for us. He said, every promise in my word is for you, is yours. But don't just read it, meditate on it, bring it to life for yourself. And then put such pressure on it that you can have anything the Bible says. So I want to look at one of these passages. I'm working with a new Bible so the pages are sticky. You have cheated me out of tithes and offerings due to me. God is talking. You are cursed for your whole nation has been cheating me. You are cursed with a curse if you rob me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there will be enough food in my temple. Keep the lights on, the, heat's on, the heat on, the air on. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, who's talking? The Lord of heaven's armies. I will open the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out such a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Very few people put God to the test. Every time I put God to the test, he, it, it, the word always works. It always comes through for me. Your crops will be abundant and I will guard them from insects and disease. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it and put me to the test. I want to challenge you to put God to the test. What's your most difficult area that you're confronted with? What's your hardest challenge? You start putting God to the test and prove him and telling him, I'm putting you to the test, Lord, and tell him what it is that you want. Did you know this is godly to do that? It's godly to do that. He doesn't just want us throwing money in the offering and then not getting a return. He said we could have a hundredfold return. Now, it doesn't all come back in money. It comes in, back in spirituality. It comes back in many, many ways. But God wants to bless his people. So let's stand and prepare our hearts to serve him in the offering. Tithes and offerings. Lord, we do bring our tithes and offerings to you. You're a good God. You're a wonderful God. You want to bless us. And so we thank you for blessing us now because we are going to test you. We are going to prove you in Jesus' name. Let's open our Bibles to Ephesians 1. I 
want to talk about the goodness of God. We serve a good, good God. He said in James, there's no shadow of turning in him. That means there's never a shadow in God. There's nothing but pure light. God never changes. He's always the same. He loves us the same always. Even when we do wrong things, he still loves us. So many people get under guilt and condemnation, and it's just the devil's ploy to keep you bound. Even if you do wrong things, don't get under guilt and condemnation. Take it to God and ask God to change you. Don't you spend time asking God to change you by his glory? Boy, I want to be changed by his glory. Ephesians 1. Let's pick it up. Um, well, let's pick it up in verse 3. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Every spiritual blessing. Let me ask you, do you have every spiritual blessing? You do legally, but have you appropriated it for yourself experientially? Do you live in the every blessings of God? Any answers? Do you live in the every single blessing of God? It's our job to ferret out every blessing that God has and to live in it, to have it, to appropriate it for ourselves. That's what God wants us to do. And we are blessed with every blessing in spiritual and heavenly places because we are united with Christ. Everything gets back to this. How close do you walk with Jesus? We need to walk so closely with Jesus that we can see him, we can feel him, we can hear him, you can feel his presence. When you read the Bible, you feel his presence. But you need to be able to feel his presence, pray until his presence comes down and envelops you. When we first got filled with the Spirit, God told all of our family members to come home, to live with mom and dad. And so we all came home. It was, it was the move of God. We all came home. We were all Spirit-filled at that time, my brother and his wife and two kids, my sister, me, my mom and dad. And we all lived together. And every day, what we set out to do was seek the Lord. We didn't have any hidden agendas. We didn't have any other thing to do during the day because God said, give me time with you. Have you given him time with you? He said, give me your time. And so we would come together every single morning. Our job was to come and seek the Lord. Now, I was just spirit filled. So was my sister, my brother, my mother had been filled with the Spirit many years. I smoked cigarettes because I, in college I had a boyfriend who smoked. So I would come with my cigarettes and my coffee. My sister would too, my brother. I don't think mother smoked at that time, but she smoked all those years and so did my dad. So we came as we were. We weren't cleaned up yet. This was years ago. We weren't cleaned up. We just came as we were to seek God. And we sat down at that big dining room table. And we started praying in the Spirit. We all prayed in the Spirit, newly prayed in the Spirit. Now I've been praying in the Spirit for a lot of years. But we all came with ourselves, our hang-ups. I think I was still trapped in um, Hinduism and Buddhism at the time. My sister was on the verge of divorce. That's why she could come. We were a mess, except my mother. She was always a saint. She'd been filled with the Spirit when my brother was dying of rheumatic fever when he was a child. And an angel of the Lord came to her. And my brother Mike was going to die that night. My mother knew it. And she cried out to God, and God sent an angel of the Lord. And the angel, angels, you have to employ the use of angels. They're sent to minister for you. We do too much on our own. Do you understand the supernatural things we try to do? 
We try to change this person. We try to change this circumstance. They're unchangeable humanly. You can't do it. Stop it. Now, I'm not saying stop praying. I'm not saying stop Jesus and seeking him for that person or for yourself if you've got a hang up. I am saying employ the ministry of angels. Go get angels to help you. Mike was dying. He'd been bedridden for a year. My sister and I had rheumatic fever. Mother had to carry us to the bathroom. Three kids, many times a day. She was as skinny as a rail. Mike was not going to make it. Mike was our treasure. My brother was our treasure. He was our hero in life. We used to have a huge bedroom together. It had French doors. And my sister and I, my brother, we each had our own bed. It was a huge room in different places of the room. And so Mike would take one of his dirty socks and, you know, that he had worn that day and tie him up and we'd play catch <laughs> three ways in that huge bedroom. And then he'd say, come on, come on over here. And so our mother and father were in the other room watching TV, just right next door. So we'd climb into bed with Mike and he'd tell us about all the exploits he was going to do. How he was going to build, oh God. how he's going to build a, a tree house in the back. And he would describe to us the tools. Now he's just a little kid and we're just little kids. How he was going to take dad's tools, his dad's tools, my dad's tools, and he was going to build this tree house for us. And he told us how he was going to lay it out. And how he was going to build it and we'd be able to climb up into those apple trees from that tree house. And we reveled in my brother's dreams. And so we would just sit and listen to him with rapt attention. How he was going to be this, in our words, this magnificent hero that was going to do all these exploits. And we were always so taken with him, his magnificence and his heroism. One time... We went over to this, we went over to this uh, vacant lot and we would, somebody gave us a bit and a bridle and reins. And so he put one on me, the bit and bridle and reins, and Lester, his best friend, put one on my sister and they would gallop us around. We had an oversized lot, probably three quarters of an acre, and they would gallop us around and we were the horses. And so we went to the vacant lot to play. It was Lester's vacant lot and we ran around playing and I stepped on a nail. And if you've ever been a little kid and you stepped on a nail, it hurts. It hurts a lot. And so my brother, my hero, carried my leg. He couldn't carry me. He was too little. He carried my leg all the way home. <laughs> and I had to hop on one foot as he carried my leg all the way home. He was a magnificent brother. He was a magnificent person. And it was mother in that line, God said, you go, stay with Mike. He's not going to make it. He will not make it unless you sit there with him. And so she got in bed with him. He was lying flat and she was sitting up. And she began to call upon the name of the Lord. It was impossible for Mike to live. He'd been bedridden a year there was nothing they could do, nothing more they could do. She called upon the name of the Lord because it was impossible. She had to have angelic help. She had to have the help of Jesus Christ. She knew Jesus Christ as her Savior. She was a saint. I never heard my mother ever swear. She never said bad words about people. She never criticized. She never complained. My mother was a saint. And she cried out to the Lord. And God came to her, the Holy Ghost. We didn't know about the Holy Spirit. We were Lutherans. My dad was a deacon, not a deacon. He was an elder in the, in the Lutheran church. He would preach the sermons when the pastor was gone. And my sister and I, my brother, we'd be sitting on the front row. And we'd dangle our feet off the pew. And we couldn't even reach the bottom. And we would just stare in rapt attention 
at my dad preaching these powerful sermons. And so my mother, in the, in the, in the Lutheran church, you, aren't, you, you hear the word Holy Spirit, but you don't know who he is or what he is. At least as a child, you don't. But my mother called out to God and said, rescue my son, save my son. You've got to help me. And the Holy Spirit came to her. And she said, he was as gentle as a dove and landed on her cheek. And she was instantly filled with the Holy Spirit. And everything broke because of the power of the Holy Spirit. She looked down at Mike and Mike was resting peacefully and she knew he would live. What I'm saying to you, there are impossible situations and we can't do them ourselves. Stop trying to do things in yourself. Yes, we use our grit and our fortitude, our guts, our spiritual guts to call out to the Lord, but you have to call out to Jesus to get these impossibilities done and you have to call upon the angels of God. Learn about the angels of God. Go get angelic help. You have to have them. I want to read you some scriptures about the angels. Let's go to Hebrews. Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm because we are united with Christ. Angels are to help you do things you can't do. They're to help you with impossibilities in life. Hebrews 1.14 Let's pick it up in five. For God never said to any angels what he said to Jesus. You are my son. Today I have become your father. I will be his father and he will be my son. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, his supreme son. You better know the power in the name. Study it. Don't go against your enemy where you haven't loaded up with scripture about the power in the name. And when he brought his supreme son into the world, God said, let all the angels of God worship him. We don't worship angels, we bow to Jesus. Regarding the angels, he said, he sent his angels like winds and his servants like flames of fire. Sometimes they come into a room. When I was first filled with the Holy Spirit, they would come into my bedroom like flames of fire and they would flutter their wings all night long for night after night when we were all living together like that. They would flutter their wings in my room and let me know. My sister told me that they fluttered their wings in her bedroom too to let them know we're real, we're here to assist the heirs of salvation. And what we did in that house when all of us came and moved back home, we prayed by the hour. We had our Bibles in front of our faces. Don't pray without a Bible. I, there's no way I could even pray without a Bible. I have to have my Bible. And what we did was pray by the hour and hour and hour. And then when the Holy Spirit said lifted, we knew when he lifted, then he said get to work and we'd go to our various jobs in the home. So learn about the angels. Let all the angels worship him. Regarding the angels, he said he sends his angels like winds, his servants like flames of fire. Your throne, O oh God, endures forever and ever. You rule with a scepter of justice. You love justice and hate evil. Cry out to God for justice when you're in an impossible situation and somebody is doing you wrong or your relative is not listening. Cry out for justice with mercy. Now, if you're dealing with an evil one, you cry out for justice. We have to understand the power of the angelic ministry to us because we're going to be faced with things where only angel, angels can solve it. Now, let me say that because it means that God will send his angels. Of course, we go to Jesus and God the Father on everything. But I mean God will send us angels. Therefore, angels are servants, their spirit sent to care for people care for us who will inherit salvation. 
So we would pray. Now I had come out of college, um, had a boyfriend who was a philosophy teacher, assistant. He filled me full of philosophy. We would go out and talk for eight hours at a time and he would fill this garbage of philosophy. I was born again. But as he filled me with philosophy, I used to be able to look up as a child and see my heavenly father. But as he kept at me, eight hours at a time standing, having somebody to discourse on philosophy. Don't do it. Don't ever, do, don't ever make my mistake. Pretty soon, I saw these billows like of parachutes or big clouds. And they came between me and my heavenly father and I could no longer see him. Never have fellowship with someone, extended kind of fellowship with someone who does not know Jesus. I didn't know these things. I was just a teenager going to college. So I went to school, took many classes that were stupid, but they were new age and they were uh, of this world. So I was a mess. You know my story. God took me to climb the Matter Matterhorn in, in Switzerland because he had to bring me back to him. And so why did you choose the Matterhorn? That's a big mountain. I didn't really appreciate that at the time. But I want to jump ahead. So when we lived in that house, I was a mess, a total mess. And we prayed by the hour and we prayed by the hour. And so one day, some of these things are just, you, you won't believe them. But they're true. Do you want me to tell you? They're very embarrassing. Now, I always had a prophetic voice. From the minute I got filled with the Spirit, God told me I was called to the office of the prophet. And so I always had a prophetic voice. And I was learning the ropes. I was learning what that meant. So we went. Now remember, I'm all messed up with college. All those classes, all the bad doctrine, quote unquote. So we went to a church. It's called uh, Miracle Temple. My brother was with me. My mother, were you there? And his wife were there. And all these people are there. And I prophesy and said, hark, 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 the gang's all here. And they knew by my saying that, that there were demons in the room that had followed people and bound them. And those people were so bound they couldn't get free. And I was one of them. And I had to prophesy that. Think how humiliating that was to me. But I couldn't hold it back. It had to come out. Because they had to know I was one of the bound ones. So the pastor, such a marvelous man, he called us all down front who were being afflicted by demons and who had any, any struggle in their lives. So I went down front. And there was a, a big woman, buxom woman, my gosh, and her name was Fran, and she said, she laid hands on me. And she said, God's going to send you an angel. Don't look for him, but when he's there, you'll see him. Isn't that interesting? I know Jesus as my Savior. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm finding out what that means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm just recently filled with the Holy Spirit. So I don't know how to operate in the Spirit yet. I don't even know the Word yet. We read the Word nonstop when we're all together like that. But I don't know much of anything. And what does God say to me? He says he's going to send me an angel. And that angel is going to protect me. And that angel is going to help me. They are angels, are servants. They're my servants. They're your servants. Do you ever use them? Do you ever say, angels, I need this. I can't do this by myself. Go bring it to me. Go help me. Give me assistance. And so I didn't know what that mean, meant, that you're gonna, he's going to give you an angel. Don't look for him. But when he's there, you'll know. So the very next day, my habit is to go kneel by my bed and pray by the hour in tongues. I'm still... I've still only got baby tongues. This is how fresh I was born again. 
I only got two syllables when I was filled with the Spirit, and it was the French alphabet, Abba, Abada, Abada, three. That's all I had. And God said to me, if you will be faithful with this little teeny language, I'm going to enlarge it for you. And so I had my little three words, Abada, Abba, Abada. I had them for a long time. And God said, you go kneel by your bed and you use that little baby language and I'm going to expand them. Now I have at least five languages, at least, and they're all different. One is for rebuking the devil. One is deep intercession. One is tongues of angels, a special communication with God. Every believer can have these languages and you need to press into God for them because each one of these languages has something different that they do. I have a Chinese language. I'm telling you that Chinese language rips down ramparts of the devil and destroys strongholds and rebukes the devil. Each one, each language does something different. You have to develop yourself with your language. You can't just sit there with an abada with me. You have to get those languages developed and get four, five, six languages so you can do different things at different times for different people and for different needs. And then you have to learn how to work with your angels. So I was headed into my bedroom to get on my knees and do my prayers in tongues. And all of a sudden I walked into the room, my bed was right there, and I looked up at the window and there was a huge angel standing by the window. He had a golden crown. He had golden locks right down, you know, to the bottom, a little bit longer than his ears. Very curly and well-kempt and a huge golden crown and a white robe and a sash across, across his chest and then another sash around his waist. And he stood there and I looked at him and he said to me, I am your guardian angel. And he put his power on me and I couldn't stand. I had to go to my knees. There was 50,000 pounds on me and I could not stand. So I went to my knees. I couldn't stand up. And then he took my hands. I did not do it. I've never told this story before. Not in full length. He took my hands and he took my hands up like this to my head. And now, and then he took my head and he smushed my head into the bed. So now I'm bent over these thousand pounds on my hands have got me bent over into the bed. I'm on my knees. And then we start a process that lasted probably an hour and a half. I didn't know what was going to happen. I just knew I trusted that angel because he was sent from Jesus Christ, my Savior. And he was going to do something for me that I couldn't do for myself. I couldn't get free. I would go out on the back porch and I would writhe in agony because there was something in me that wasn't of God and I would writhe and writhe in agony. And it was... New Age, it was philosophy. Let me back up a little. All the classes from school, that was bad enough. But then I remember one time the, whatever his name was, the, what? The Maharishi Ji came to Seattle. And I had a boyfriend at that time. And I said, let's go up there. I want to see what this is. I was just been filled with the Spirit. I didn't know about don't touch anything evil. I didn't know. I thought maybe this was God. This is how utterly ignorant I was. I said, let's go up there. Come on, let's go up there. And so he drove me up there. He was really against it. He did not want to do it. He was a good old American boy, you know, who, you know, meat and potatoes. He didn't believe in all that garbage. But when I was in Paris, I went to school in Paris, and I would go to Sacre-Cœur. 
the Sacre Coeur. It's the Sacred Heart of Jesus. It was a huge, you can Google it, a huge uh, cathedral. And I had, I had bought a, a pendant that said the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And on one side and on the other side, it showed Jesus kind of taking, opening his being, and there was his heart on fire. It was precious to me. I wore it ever since then. So he drove me up to the Maharishiji, and he would sit in a tent. There were people all around my age, you know, teenager, 19. And he would ask us one by one to come in. One by one we would go in. So I came in and sat down, and he said, I am going to give you your secret mantra to pray. Well, I didn't want a mantra. I just wanted to know more about Jesus. I was only interested in Jesus. I wasn't interested in him. I wasn't interested in his stupid mantra. I just wanted more of Jesus, and I thought he could give me some wisdom. How foolish we are when we're young and stupid and ignorant. I was so ignorant. And so he said, here's your mantra, and he said a word, which I will not repeat. It's of the devil. Why would I ever repeat it? And I immediately dismissed it and said, I will never say that. I will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. I knew that much. I got up and left, and I thought, what a dud. This is just, this man is just nothing. He's just, it's so wrong for him to be doing this for all these people. I got outside the tent, and my boyfriend was there, and I went up to my neck to touch my necklace, and it was gone. The devil had stripped it from me. It broke my heart. Now, that was start of the dawn of understanding. You don't touch anything of the devil. You don't go to the devil's places if you do. A bar, a nightclub, a strip joint, pornography. Pornography, you're just having sex with demons. Don't you know that? You're having sex with demons. They will be your lovers. So, I was heartbroken. He drove me back home. And because I had also become a Buddhist and a Hindu in my stupidity, in my college years. I thought that was the way to go. And when I was a Buddhist and a Hindu, I would go out sometimes and just eat grass and not eat any other thing but grass. Now, is that stupid? Have you ever known somebody so stupid? <laughs> she says, no. And so I would go on these long fasts with nothing to eat. I had been standing by the refrigerator and a voice spoke to me and said, if you will stop eating, I will show you a great secret. Yeah, a great secret was I got mononucleosis. <laughs> that was the big secret. So I went for long periods of time without grass, without, without grass, without food. And then I began to do yoga. Now I believe there might be a yoga that's good for exercise. But this yoga was delivered by demons. So now I've got yoga delivered by demons. I've got Hinduism, Buddhism. And now I've taken, I didn't take the mantra, but I went up to that. I can't even find a kind enough word. That miscreant. That's all I can say of him. And I'm so racked with pain, I would go out in the backyard and writhe in agony trying to get rid of what was in me that was wrong. It was in my spirit. It was in wherever it was lodged. Now, remember, I'd just gotten filled with the Spirit. So now the Holy Spirit is warring against what's wrong in me. And I am really bad trouble. I am really mucked up with all that inconceivable stupidity. And I would put on my little orange bikini and I would go out <laughs> with my cigarettes and my coffee and I would writhe in agony to be free. So, now fast forward. I go to the church, Miracle Temple, and I'm telling you he had miracles. And Fran, that woman up front, says, God's going to give you an angel. And when he comes, don't look for him, but when he comes, you'll know it. Then I walk into my bedroom to do my usual prayers on my knees. And I look up and I see this beautiful angel with blonde, curly hair and the big uh, crown. 
and his gown. I get on my knees. He has a force and a power that is beyond me. And he took my hands and put my hands to my head and put my head into my Bible that was on the bed. And he began to erase and take out every lie I had been told. So I would see a lie come up, such as, you know, what that Maharishi told me. I would see the lie come up. I would ask forgiveness. I would deeply repent. And then he'd take it out. Then I'd see another lie about the new age or about philosophy or about all the wrong things I'd been taught in college. This went on for an hour and a half. I'd see the lie. The lie would come up. I'd repent for the lie. I'd ask forgiveness and say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't know any better. And then he'd take it out. Lie after lie after lie after lie after lie. All from what they call higher education. Oh my gosh, it wasn't higher education. It was from the evil one. And this went on. I wasn't, I didn't tire of it. There was such power on me and such glory on me. And my hands were welded to my head where my brain is. And all the filthy lies the devil had told me. Stop eating and I will show you a great mystery. That was one of the lies. All of them came out, lie after lie after lie. But after the lie, my angel would give me a scripture. Now, I didn't know the Bible that well. He would give me a scripture that combated the lie. A lie would come, he would give me a scripture that was perfect for that lie. A lie would come, he'd give me another scripture. We did this for an hour and a half. All the lies than a scripture that would combat the lie. He was cleaning me out. He was reaming me out. He was cleaning all the strongholds out of me that had caused me to go in the backyard and just writhe in agony to be free. It went on for such a long time. I never tired. I was in ecstatic joy because our guardian angels are perfect and they bring with them the power to deliver us out of anything. God sends them. We pray the word of God and they have to. Psalm 104, verse 4, they have to hearken unto the voice of God's word. Psalm 103, they must hearken. You pray the scripture and they must come to your rescue. So finally, after an hour and a half, I could feel a release in my hands. And I looked over at my angel, and he went, Phew, and he took off. Now, I'm not saying we worship angels. We don't. We worship Jesus Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, the mighty three in one. But I am saying, if you haven't accessed your angel, if you're trying and struggling to quit a habit, yes, you go to God first. God, I repent of this habit. I've got to get free. You've got to help me. You do anything you have to to get free. When God... When we would come to that table, all of us smoked cigarettes. One day I took a drag of a cigarette. Those dumb boyfriends, you know, they all smoked. <laughs> and I wanted to be with them, so I smoked. I, took, I went to took, take a drag of that cigarette. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, would Jesus smoke? And I said, oh, no, Jesus wouldn't smoke. And he said, then neither shall you. One week, you go without food. One week, nothing comes into your mouth but water. And so I stopped cold, no food, only water. And after the week, I was so gloriously set free, I couldn't believe that I'd ever done such a stupid habit. I'm telling you, our angels are there to help us, the heirs of salvation. You don't do salvation alone. First, we go to God the Father. We go to God the Son. We got, go to God the Holy Spirit. We tell him all of our woes. But if you're struggling hard with something, send your angel. If there's something you can't do, you can't get free of a habit, you say to God, I want angelic assistance. I always fall into the same trap, smoking, drinking, porn, whatever it is. I always fall into the same trap. Send me my angel to help me. Holy Ghost, you help me. You gird me up with your loins, lest I dash my foot against a stone. 
I'm telling you, I was a mess. But after that day, guess what? I was no longer a mess. I was as right as rain. I was as pure as driven snow. I was just, now I had to start learning the right way of everything. But I was totally, you know, he gutted me like a fish. He really did. He cleaned me all out. I had no more strongholds. I had no more writhing. You know, I'd go on the back steps and just writhe in agony, a pain that you can't even locate. It's in your spirit. It's in your being somewhere. And it's demonic. And you don't know how to get rid of it. I'm telling you. Guardian angels are sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. Remember with Daniel in the lion's den, he said to the king, a lion has come and shut them, uh, excuse me, uh, the lion of Judah. Angels have come from the throne of God and shut the lion's mouth so that they cause me no harm. We don't even access the ministry of angels like we must. We don't. But you need to start. Now, it doesn't come first before Jesus. You know that. It doesn't come before God our Father, the Holy Ghost, or the Word of God. But there are times you've got some Herculean task. You ask angels. Angels, you've got to help me. The winds are your messengers. Flames of fire are your servants. Those are angels. Just think. They're messengers. They bring you messages sometimes. They came to Mary, delivered a message. Flames of fire are your servants. And Psalm 103. I want to read Psalm 103, 103 in closing. Let all that I am praise the Lord. With my whole heart I will praise his holy name. Let all that I am praise the Lord. May I never forget the good things he's done for me. He forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord loves righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. Did you hear that? The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He reveals his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to anger, and filled with unfailing love. The Lord never lets us down. Verse 20, praise the Lord, you his angels, you mighty ones who carry out his plans, listening for each of his commands. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels. You need an army? Ask God for his angelic army to keep you safe. If you've got to do something that's terrifying to you or scary or hard for you, ask God to send his angels. Yes, praise the Lord, you armies of angels who serve him and do his will. Praise the Lord. Everything he has created, everything praise the Lord. Now, isn't it interesting? I was saved. I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then God had to send me an angel to get me delivered. I was supernaturally delivered from all that horror in an hour and a half by an angel. By an angel. What about your loved one who's bound? Why don't you ask the Lord to send an angel to him to get him unbound? We've had many encounters with angels. We've had encounters with Jesus. We've had encounters with the Word of God. It's all, it all belongs to us in its proper way. Do you understand? We are not lauding the ministry of angels over Jesus. No, no, no. But think about it. I was delivered from so many things. How many things? I can't even count. In an hour and a half by an angel. So I want to lead this to you. If you've got somebody who's difficult in life, start sending the angels to lead and guide them into all truth. Start sending the angels to clean that person up. You can't get them cleaned up. Start commissioning your angels to go to him and change that person. And we ask God to do the same thing, but m angels are ministering spirits sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. That's you. That's me. Let's pray. Now, God in our hard spots, the things that we can't even do. Lord, we're asking. We know the ministry of angels is valid. 
whatever is valid and right for them to do. We send, we ask that you send from your throne. And we are asking ministering spirits to go minister to our loved ones who have not seen the light. And then we pray Ephesians 1 and 3. God, fill them with the knowledge of your will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Open the eyes of their understanding and flood them with light. And then God, you send your angel to bring them and lead them and guide them to all truth of the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Do this for the ones that you love that are wayward. I see that child that's going off. I don't know whose child this is. I see this child who's going off. There's a child that's going off. Start sending your angels to go bring that one back into the truth of the gospel, into Jesus Christ and into fellowship with Jesus Christ. You send your angels to that person, that child that has gone off. Are you hearing me? You send the angels of God to that child who's going off and ask the angels, bring them back into the truth of the gospel and to the truth of the Bible and to the word of God. Back to Jesus. You bring that child of mine back to Jesus. In Jesus' name. Do you hear me? You bring that husband into the... You go and bind him. Bring him back into the truth of the gospel. I'm tired of wrangling with his flesh and his soul. Angels, you go get him set free. You go minister to him. Angels, you know how to do this. Jesus, and this is all under your auspices because you granted us the angels. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. If you would like prayer for any reason, the Holy Spirit is ready to pray for you, whatever it is you need. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We love you.